All right. This is shitty to talk about because no one wants to like to talk about when they were poor and miserable, but I'll talk about it. First off, if you haven't read any of my books, which you don't have to, I went to law school at Duke and then I got a job as a lawyer, right? And I got fired in three weeks and I deserved to be fired. It was not, it was not a, like, I don't look back and think they screwed me. I 100% brought it on myself. I got really drunk at a firm event and acted like a, a jackass. And then a female partner propositioned me and I like, I turned her down and then I told everybody. It was like, I was the worst employee uh, that's ever been in a law firm. So they fired me as they should have. And then um, I went to work for my father. Uh, my family has a business, restaurants, like a small few restaurants in South Florida. I got fired in three weeks as a lawyer. It took my dad a lot longer, uh, six months until he fired me. And so I got fired literally from the two things that I had trained for in my life law and business and and not just fired like from a job my family my father fired me from the family business i didn't know i didn't know what i was going to do at that point and i didn't have a lot of options at the time i was writing email i was living in south florida which it's just the armpit of america if you live in South Florida, I'm not even going to apologize to you because you know it sucks. I was writing emails to my friends about how awful it was and how much I hated it. Both my life in South Florida, but mainly my life. A lot of times when you're miserable, you're just funny. And I was like one of those funny, miserable people. And so I would try and make my friends laugh. That's what you do with your friends, right? You tell stories that are really embarrassing and you try and... And make your friends laugh because what else do you have in your life? <laughs> I had nothing. I'm unemployed and I live with my parents. My friends thought they were funny. And they were like, hey, you should be a writer. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Be a writer. This is nonsense. And then my friends pointed out the obvious thing in my life. Well, dude, you're not going to be a lawyer. And you're not going to work in business. So this is the only thing we see you doing that's even half well. So I was like, okay. So I, I took like five emails that I thought were good, that they thought were funny. Not even me, because I didn't think any of my writing was funny. I thought everyone did what I did. I thought everything I wrote was funny to my friends, but not funny to anyone else. And I only thought it was funny to them because they told me it was funny. And I sent it out to every agent and every publisher, like a thousand or 500. When I say that I got zero positive responses, I mean that literally. Like 90% ignored me, right? More than 95%, no response. And then maybe 5% sent like, or 4% sent like, form rejection letters, right? You know, the standard, thank you for your inquiry at this time, blah, blah, blah. But I actually had three or four people took the time to write personalized rejections. Like I really remember one very clearly, you should never write anything again. You shouldn't even write email. This is the worst thing I've ever read. Like it was, it was pretty brutally mean, man, to be honest. It was so mean that it was almost funny. But at that point, I was already starting to get really positive response from my writing because my friends would forward it to other people and then they would email me back and be like, oh, this is so funny. So I was like, okay, if other people think it's funny, then the publishing people must be wrong, which I turned out I was right. But at the time I had no rational reason to expect that. I got 100% rejected from publishing, so I didn't know what to do. And so at the time, the internet was like kind of becoming big and, and you could do stuff on the internet. So... I put up my own site and I had to learn to program HTML and whatever and I put it up. It got some attention and then it kind of started going. I posted on this site called College Humor, which is like a big deal now, but at the time was, you know, new and and that kind of did well and then it just kind of went and went and went and went because I didn't know how to be a professional writer at all and no one in publishing was still paying attention to me. I didn't even know what it meant. So there was the very first self-publishing company was this company called Lulu which still exists today. They're, they're pretty down market, but they're solid. They're a reputable company. And it costs very little to self-publish. It's not super high quality, but it's something, right? And so at the time, it was pretty groundbreaking. And so I published with them, and the book was terrible. Like the, the cover, the formatting, I didn't know what to do, right? I mean, and there was really not a lot of information at all at the time. Now there's a lot of information, and most of it's not very good, which is why we're doing this. But at the time, there wasn't even the bad information. There was pretty much none. And so it came out and it sold a few copies. And it, like, I think I was able to buy chicken one week. Uh, like I, I didn't have a lot of protein in my diet. <laughs> like I basically had to date girls who had jobs so that I could eat full meals and not just ramen. And then so, uh, you know, like I added protein to my diet uh, because of my self-published book. And then MTV came and did a documentary about me. It was back when it was like meeting people because I had a date application page on my site. Because it's a humor site, right? Meeting people on the internet was still like a weird, creepy thing. And I wasn't actually really meeting girls. It was kind of a joke. But they 
you know, MTV, they don't care about anything for real. They're just like, are you going to make a fool of yourself on TV? Great, then we'll come film you. And I was like, yeah, I, I make a fool of myself every day. So doing it on TV <laughs> would be fine. And so they filmed me. Um, it was a whole episode about dating on the Internet. So it was like me and two other people. And like I just went on dates with girls that I said I met through the Internet. And some of them I did, some I didn't. And then I would get drunk and act like an idiot and... It did pretty well, the show. And so my site blew up and then like a bunch of publishers came and they wanted to publish the book. And long, long story short, my first book came out, I Hope They Serve Beer in Hell, in 2006. Actually, long story short, that's part of the interesting part. It took me another year and a half to write the book. I got the deal in like, I think it was the middle of 04 actually. It was, the middle of 04. And I turned the book in. It took me about eight months. And you know what I'm saying? Like I'd already written most of the stories, but like editing and putting it all together and there was so much stuff I did, didn't know how to, I had to learn how to do everything by doing it and failing at it and being miserable and so I turned the book in at the beginning of January like January February March of 05 it came out in January 06 and it hit the bestseller list and the only reason it did is because I had an email capture on my website and this is back before email really blew up and so I had like 10,000 people waiting to buy my book and they all bought it the first two weeks. And so I was on the list for two weeks and then it fell off. But because I had that fan base and because the book was good, word of mouth just kind of spread. I said the right thing at the right time. You know, I, I stood up, I told my truth, I was honest about my life. I talked about things that everyone, everyone at a certain age gr uh, group was drinking, acting like an idiot, hooking up, just being a, an idiot, you know, all the shit we do in college, right? I just wrote about it. But I used my real name and I was pretty funny. There you go. Like it took off. It spread by word of mouth actually. Like all my fans, my few little fans told their friends and then they told their friends. And then in May of 2007, the book went back on the bestseller list. And then it stayed on until sometime in 2012. I wrote three other books in that genre. The, the New York Times ended up calling the genre fratire and said I invented a literary, literary genre, literally. <laughs> Which is very funny to think about uh, at the time because I was just getting drunk and writing about it. But then I got tired of writing about it, man. Like I just, what it was super fun for me when I was 27 wasn't fun for me anymore at 37. And so I just retired from that genre. I realized something. And I, like, I could have realized this way earlier. I'm just slow sometimes. I realized that, that everyone wanted to write a book. Everyone. I can count on one hand the number of people I've met who said I'd never want to write a book. Pretty much everyone does. And they all ask me, how do you write a book? And I would always tell them how. A lot of times, honestly, if I'm being really honest, I would give them the bullshit answer. Uh, which is like, you have to, basically I would say some version of you have to open a vein on your computer and suffer and all this nonsense, right? But that's the bullshit elitist writer answer. That's the answer you give when you want to feel special. And all writers want to feel special. That's why they write. And so it took me a, a while to realize that. And the, the, the real reason I, I, I realized how stupid that answer is is because I was at this entrepreneur dinner and this woman called me out. She told me about this amazing, it was a really good book idea. And people have been asking her to write it for 10 years. But she, you know, she has a family and she has her own business. It's very successful. that She runs. And so she's like, I, you know, I don't have time to do all this stuff you're telling me. How do I get this book out of my head quickly and easily? And so I'm like, are you asking me how to be a writer without writing? And she's like, yeah, kind of. And so I start making fun of her and like lecturing her about hard work, which is of course preposterous because this woman's done way more shit than I ever had, at least at that point, probably to this day. But anyway, so she's like, Tucker, this is an entrepreneur dinner. Are you an entrepreneur? And I'm like, yeah, of course. And she's like, mm, I don't think so. Because if you were really an entrepreneur, you'd help me solve my problem and not lecture me about hard work. And I was like, oh, fuck. So she's totally right. And so I became obsessed with that problem. How do I make writing a book easy? How do I make it so that you don't have to suffer to write it? I mean, you're going to have to work hard, right? It's not, you have to do stuff. Like it can't just be instantaneous. But when I actually looked at the problem, I realized it was way harder than it had to be. And so I got on a whiteboard and I literally wrote out every single step in writing a book. And I realized that it could be way easier. There were a ton of books on how to write, but none of them actually walked people through how to write a book in a systematic way that actually works, that will really get a result. There's two types of books. There were 
things like Stephen King's On Writing or Anne Lamott's Bird by Bird, which I think Bird by Bird is a terrible book. A lot of people recommend it. I'll tell you why it's terrible is because everything in there is about how to be a professional writer, which for most people, they don't want that. They want to just tell their story or they want to write their book, one book or maybe two books and that's it. They're not trying to do it for a living. And so her advice is terrible for most people. And she has very little actual practical step-by-step stuff. Most of her stuff is find the right wood grain for your desk and then figure it out. It's like, that's not advice. That's terrible. And then the other section of books were the very practical step-by-step books, but they were written by marketers to sell bullshit courses. They're, they're, They're not good. They don't actually tell you about the emotional parts of writing a book or about courage or fear or structure or they don't really bring in the parts that writers understand. And so I realized I was in a really unusual position. I could be the first person who's actually a big time fancy writer but who he wasn't trying to be a big time fancy writer who came from nothing, who started in the place that most people do and who learned it all himself. I can explain it in a way and teach it in a way and build a company that does it in a way that anyone with a book in them can get it out. And that's what Scribe is. And we're now, as of this recording, we're five years old. We have close to 50 full-time tribe members. We've got about 125 part-time freelance. We've done 500 books that are published and out. We just did our 500th book yesterday, literally, as, as I'm filming this. So by the time you see this, we'll have way more. And then we have another 800 to 1,000 in process right now that are going and signing more every day. And that's before Scribe Book School. Our goal is to 10 or 100x that. And this is how we're doing it. By taking all the information, both that I started with and that we've improved on. I mean, me and the team and the tribe have made this process just absolutely amazing in the five years. And it's getting better every time. Our goal is to give every piece of this information away. I don't believe you should have to pay for the information. I think if you wanna write a book, you shouldn't have to suffer the way I did. I'm gonna give it to you all for free because I want you to write your book and I want everyone to write their book, to tell their story. Now, services, that costs money, right? You want my time, that costs money. You want uh, my expertise on your specific book, that costs money. You want us to do stuff for you, of course that costs money. But the information, the how, that's free and that's free forever. I'm a big believer that the more books there are, the better the world is. The more we share information, the more we learn from each other, the more we tell our stories, the better off the world is. The more we heal, the smarter we are, the more problems we can solve. That's why we're doing this. All right, so here's the reason I'm telling you this whole story. I know you don't really care that much about me. That's cool. I wanted you to understand though why we got here because it matters for you. I want you to believe you can reinvent yourself and that you can write a book. I started where you are. I started probably behind where you are. We've helped people who were in worse spots than you get to it. I want you to understand it's possible. You're going to have to show up. You're going to have to do the work. But the thing you don't have to do is you don't have to figure out how to do it. You just have to do it. But you got to show up and you got to do the work. And it begins with you believing.